Unique people leading unique lives shape and inform Iowa City. This community is enhanced by these women and men who live in our midst, working, teaching, creating. Welcome to a series of conversations with people who have stories to tell. Join my guests and me, Ellen Buchanan, in a series of interviews called One of a Kind. My guest on One of a Kind is Tom Gelman, lawyer, community volunteer, husband, and father. A West High School alumnus, Tom graduated with honors from Harvard in 1975, returning to Iowa, receiving a degree from the U of I College of Law. His professionalism and volunteerism is legendary. Besides serving on the board of the directors for the Iowa Alumni Association, legal counsel for the University of Iowa Foundation. He has given his time and energy to the Iowa City Chamber of Commerce, the United Way, the Iowa City Public Library, the Community Leadership Program, Visiting Nurse Association, UNESCO City of Literature, Mercy Hospital Advisory Board, and the Johnson County Heritage Trust. Tom Gelman was named Friend of the Year by the Iowa City Public Library and was given the Library Recognition Award for his service. In addition, he received the Lauren Hickerson Distinguished Alumni Award and the Sam Walton Community Leader Award for his service to the community employees and dedication to customer service. Tom and his wife, Becky, raised two children in Iowa City, Sam and Emma. Welcome to One of a Kind. Thank you, thank you very much. Your story begins in 1953. Ah, this is your 60th year, and you were born in Iowa City. Uh, there was this wonderful story that I know, but my viewers don't, about that you and your wife were born on the very same day, and there was a little issue over both mothers wanting the same physician. Tell, tell my viewers the story. Yes, um, my wife's maiden name is Gay, and mm -hmm. she's the daughter of Charlie and Dorothy Gay. And my mom and Dorothy had the same uh, physician. My dad was an orthopedic surgeon at Mercy Hospital, and at that time, one of very few specialists. He was sort of that first crop of specialists coming to the city and working at, the, at Mercy. And he wanted to have his child delivered by an obstetrician. Uh, and the only <laughs> obstetricians at that time were at the university. Mm -hmm. So uh, he made arrangements with Dr. Randall to take care of my mother. And uh, Dr. Randall was also Dorothy's doctor. Ooh. <laughs> and on the day of my delivery, uh, Dr. Randall was called. And then when Dorothy went into labor, apparently they called the hospital and said the doctors are already on the way to the hospital but Dr. Randall was on the way to Mercy Hospital as a favor to my dad, not to University Hospital. So Dorothy was delivered by a resident that day. Ooh. And, uh, and Becky has, uh, uh, tells that story, yes. I see, I hope Dorothy forgave <laughs> oh, I think Doc she did. Randall. Uh, okay. I, think, I think she did, yes. So tell me about your first family, and you mentioned your father was an orthopedic surgeon. Tell me about their influence on you growing up. Yes, well, both my, my parents were not from Iowa City. They both came from other places. My mom from South Bend, Indiana, and my dad from Chicago. And they came here to study with Dr. Steinler, my dad did, and mm -hmm. Dr. Steinler uh, invited them to stay. But uh, uh, our home, uh, I was the youngest in the family, and uh, I think what I remember most was uh, my parents' uh, emphasis on, on independence. They, by the time I came along, they were worn out, I guess. <laughs> and uh, I remember uh, them giving me a lot of leeway and teaching me independence. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think also uh, my dad was always one to talk about uh, service and mm -hmm. to talk about uh, objectivity in one's thinking. That he often mention, uh, mentioned that and said how important it was to be an objective thinker and to uh, not always be subjective in one's uh, analysis. You grew up, you, uh, you were in Kirkwood Avenue and then yes. you moved to Manville Heights. Is it really? 
true that Rocky Shore Drive was a dirt road? Uh, Rocky Shore uh, Drive and Lee Street. And at the Lee time. Street? Yeah, and, and Parkview Terrace, which we all know as Mosquito Flats, right. was uh, uh, totally unimproved at that point in time. We moved in, I think, 55 or 56, and so I would have been about three. And there's, I don't remember a whole lot about living in Kirkwood, but uh, moving to Manville Heights was, uh, I do they remember that, it was a major uh, activity for her family at the time. And being in very intimidated by the move, I thought the woods behind our yard went on forever. And it just went to, to Lee Street, mm -hmm. essentially. That's before the elm trees had all died and we still had much thicker uh, vegetation in the community. And uh, Lee Street was not paved at the time and, and it was still gravel and Rocky Shore Drive was just a little path to Highway 6 and was, was oh. gravel and with some, uh, you know, lake or uh, river cabins along it, so. And you went to Lincoln School yes. and you, you got together later on for a Lincoln School reunion. Oh, when yes. Was, when was that? Yes, well, um, it was actually, I think, at a West High reunion, but the, the Lincoln School kids got together, or the graduates got together. That, that's and it was a special group of, of people from Lincoln School. We were very close. And, uh, and uh, I think kept that affinity throughout uh, high school and uh, also post high school. Sure. I know your parents loved art. Did, you, did they pass that love on to you? Oh, I think so. My, my dad and, and my oldest sister are fortunate enough to actually have some talent. I'm very right-handed and have limited artistic talent, but I think I was benefited by having a little bit of an artistic sensibility mm -hmm. and an, an eye. And of course, living with, my, my parents did collect art as I was growing up, and living with art in the home was, I think, a very tr a wonderful experience and wonderful advantage. They, they befriended Mauricio Lazansky, and so I grew up surrounded by Mauricio's prints mm -hmm. uh, in our home as well as art students who they often acquired works from. And then my parents got an interest in pre-Columbian art and primitive art, so mm -hmm. uh, African art as well. And so I got exposure to a variety of artistic forms as a child. Well, what a wonderful, wonderful childhood. You were off to, after Lincoln and junior high, off to West High. Yes. And this was a really, sh this shaped you a lot. You got involved. I know you played football, you said, the very, your freshman year. Freshman, uh, sophomore year. And was it your, oh, your sophomore and year. And that would have been the first year at West High at the time, it was just three years. Just mm -hmm. three years, so you were p playing football. But what you really hooked you was student government. It was. And uh, I don't know, it was called student council or what. Tell me about this and a time in your life. Yeah, it was uh, actually a very formative, I think. Um, West High was brand new. It was 1968, so West High just opened. Uh, Melrose Avenue wasn't completed yet, and there was a lot of other issues, but the school was being finished. We started. We had uh, new principals, and it was a sort of a blank canvas, and mm -hmm. uh, there was some... In, uh, our class was the first class to go th only to West High, to eventually graduate only from West High. And so our class felt very differently about the traditions of City High and City High. There was no animosities then at all, mm -hmm. but it w they just felt we needed to establish our own traditions. And so, like I say, it was like a blank canvas, mm -hmm. and there was lots of opportunities, and Ed Barker was there, and Dick Ferguson, they were wonderful administrators, and they provided a lot of opportunity to participate, and they really wanted a strong student government. And so we, we participated. There was a lot of us who did, but it became a very important activity for me in high school. And then you also, as a in student, either government or student council, you were asked to go and sit in on school board meetings. Yes. Yeah. Well. Uh, or it, which, it, it which was, organization was it that it, sent it you to the school board? It, it actually was uh, an idea of the student of the um, school board and of the superintendent then, who was Mr. Ruswig, mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted to get students, student representatives, on the school board. So they made available positions from each, one each at West High and City High. And when I was a senior, that was the first year that that was available. And so they put us on the school board. We didn't have a vote, mm -hmm. uh, but we were there to represent students and the interests of students. And Mo Sheridan was the student selected from, by vote, by selected from City High, and I was selected at West High. And it was really a fabulous experience in many respects. Uh, 
I, I learned a lot about local government, mm -hmm. school board. Mm -hmm. uh, had a chance to serve with wonderful members of the school board who were local citizens. One of my colleagues later in life, Phil Leff, a local attorney, and Ann Federson, a good friend. Phil, Phil Klein, Klein, John Dane, John and, Dane, and others. Yes. And, I, and John Dane taught me some very important lessons. Because John sort of intimidated me because he was conservative. Mm -hmm. And I remember a conversation with Mr. Russwig where he, where he said that um, conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat doesn't matter when it comes to education. And he was right. And John Dane was a wonderful school board member and a wonderful uh, community member, as we all know. Right. And it has nothing to do with one's policy, politics or outlook. Right. And, and so it was a, a fabulous that was a good opportunity. Lesson. Good it, was, lesson it was a good lesson. Learn. Good lesson. And learned a lot. And that was a tough year. That was a controversial year in Iowa City education. There was a lot of concerns in the community about the direction that education was taking. And it was very, very interesting. And the th other thing that was incredible was the, the, res the regard that the school administration, the, the, the Mr. Russwig and his mm -hmm. staff, and the other school board members gave the student members. We were provided with all the same information and attended all the meetings, even executive sessions. That you were treated like adults. Regular, we yes. were treated like, like a regular a school board member, like a, an yeah. adult. And the only time that we ran into issues is when Mr. Russwig took us to the state school board convention in Des Moines. And members of school boards from other communities did not like our being there which was also part of the educational experience. Interesting. They did not like students being there. Hmm. I'm sure that's changed over I'm the years. Sure it's, Let's I'm hope sure it's so. changed, but this Let's was, hope so. this but was in, uh, the, in it, the late, no, 60s. This, this would have been the, the late 60s, 60s. yeah, yep. I graduated in 71. So okay. it would have been in 1970, or in 71 would have been the year. Mm -hmm. hmm. So I know your father, you mentioned, was a physician. Uh, you chose not uh, med medicine, you chose law. Was there was, did you have somebody influence you, or you just always wanted to um, be a lawyer? I, I was. I didn't become a physician because I was squeamish. Okay. Okay. It's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> and because science was probably uh, 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 certain areas of science was more probably than I could handle. Um, and actually, I was interested in going into education. I had such a positive experience in high school that administrative education was of interest to me. But when I was in college, and, and I was actually taking some education classes. Uh, I had a brother-in-law that had just graduated with a PhD in education and was searching for a job. And it dawned on me at that point that if you're in education, you have to go where the jobs are. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of shifted gears a little bit. And then I shifted gears towards law because as a, law, as a professional, you can pick the community in which you wish to live. Mm -hmm. And although I ended up not picking Iowa City, I think it just sort of picked me. Um, uh, I thought that was important to me at that time was being able to choose where I ultimately wanted to be able to reside. So what kind of law did you choose to do? Well, when I was in law school, I thought I'd be a litigator because that's the only thing people knew about sure. because of television. It was right. the time of uh, L.A. law and, mm -hmm. and there was a tax guy in L.A. law, but it wasn't very, he wasn't very interesting. <laughs> uh, but uh, quickly as I started to practice law, I learned that litigation was of no interest to me. Uh, law, like medicine like other professions, like other uh, vocations. Uh, I think you drift to where your interests are and where your uh, character is and where your abilities are. And in law, there's very great difference between what a litigator does and what a transactional lawyer does, which is what I ended up doing. Mm -hmm. So I deal more with contracts and helping people get done what they need to get done in sort of our legal system. I do a lot of estate planning and contracts and those things. So I thought I was going to be a litigator, but ended up doing something totally different. So what did you, what have you worked? You worked with the university, I know, in two areas. What do you do for them? Same thing. Uh, I, I do transaction related act for the foundation. For the foundation. Yeah. So I and and I can't give details because, no. of course, professional right uh, confidentiality. But what I do it relates to. Uh, uh, nonprofit corporation law, tax exempt entity law, which is the sort of the special niche that a private or that a, that a charitably supported foundation falls within, okay. and it is a it is a niche area of the law. A lot of c uh, lawyers don't practice in that area, so it's an area that, because of the unique opportunity to to represent uh, the foundation and other nonprofit clients, it's mm -hmm. afforded me that area of practice. I want to talk about 
such a big part of your story is your community service. You have had your fingers in energy and time and efforts and thought into so many wonderful Iowa City organizations. And um, we, we now know from your high school days of that's kind of made you get so interested in this or spurred you on. So what, what do you decide when to take on? What, what calls you from different organizations say, I want to give to this organization. I want to you know, be on this board. Yeah, uh, it's, it's hard to know and, and it's changed over the years. I think and initially uh, I had an important experience. I worked one summer when I was in college in Washington, D.C. for one of our congressmen for Ed Mazvinsky. I worked in his office. And uh, up to that point, I thought I might want to be in politics. And after being there, it had nothing to do with Ed or his office, but it had to do with the fact of how little was getting accomplished. Mm. That was when things were getting accomplished, <laughs> as opposed to today. So I made a decision that I, rather than being engaged in sort of that level, that macro level mm -hmm. of politics or community activity, I was more interested in being engaged on a micro level, the local level. So when I came back to Iowa City and completed law school and ended up staying here, I started practice. And when you start practice, you're not very busy as a lawyer. You have to build a practice. It takes a long time. Mm -hmm. And so you have extra time. And that was a wonderful opportunity to use that extra time in a meaningful way. And opportunities came along. I got my first call, I think, was in connection with the Visiting Nurses Association. And so I gave great experience in terms of a human service organization and doing good in the community. Mm -hmm. And then my next call was for the Iowa City Public Library. And it had to do with the Friends back then, which was a separate organization. And then some other calls and quick, quickly became the Chamber of Commerce in various committees or forms. And then the Community Leadership Program was a wonderful tool. And each one of those opportunities uh, really was a growing experience, and I always felt that I was gained much more from participating, learned much more from participating than what I ever gave back. Mm -hmm. I still feel that way, that when I do something, now my time is much more limited. Now, I, after 30 some years, mm -hmm. uh, my practice is busy, and I have less time to do community activities, but it's still an important engagement with the community. It's an important give back to the community that I think we all need to do, and, and most of us do in, mm -hmm. in different ways. And um, it's just continues to remain important, but my time is more limited. So now mm -hmm. it's just a matter of, of something of interest. I mean, you should never force community involvement merely for the sake right. of community involvement. You should always do something that you're passionate about. Exactly. And That's I, why you took on UNESCO, you, the Board of City of Literature, just recently. Yeah, yes. Well, that was because of my passion about the community right. and my pride in the community and what UNESCO represents in terms of community pride. And so that was more one of more my, my more recent mm -hmm. activities. And I provided some pro bono services from a legal standpoint, from an organizational standpoint. And then after that, uh, participated on the board. Actually, my term on that's just winding down now. Are you going to re-up? Uh, I'm going to let somebody else serve on the okay. board, just because I believe in in circ recirculating boards or, or circulating boards, sure. changing boards. Yes. W what do you think you bring to the table on these the boards and organizations that you've been so involved in? Well, I think it's changed over the years. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, I bring some of my father's objectivity. Right. I hope that hopefully that's the case. Uh, I bring the legal background, which I think is useful to almost any board to have the discipline of law in, as part of the background. Um, uh, I, I think also, I think I brought different things at different times. When I was younger, I think I brought energy and time, <laughs> commitment. As I get older, when I have less time, I think I have to bring a little bit of wisdom and experience. Mm -hmm. um, also, I always try to look at the board, again, objectively to see whether there's any dysfunction, whether there's ways that the board in serving in its government role could be doing a better job for the organization, better serving the community and the organization. And there usually is. There's usually bits of dysfunction, board dysfunction, organizational dysfunction in any organization. And if you can spot what it is, and if you can sort of address it while you're there, 
and leave the board maybe a little bit better place, that I think is a desirable result. Mm -hmm. And that's tr some of what I try to do. Well, I think it was so wonderful you were awarded the Lauren Hickerson uh, Distinguished Award from yes. the University of Iowa Alumni Association. Alumni Association. Yes. Uh, yes. I don't know how many years ago that I was. I think it was in 2006. 2006. 2006. Or thereabouts, yeah. And for people who don't know, who are new to our community, Lauren Hickerson, you can tell people who he was. Well, he, he was uh, an individual who, who crossed the town-gown relationship very well. He worked for the university, but he was mayor of, uh, on city council, mayor of Iowa City for a period of time. A wonderful guy. Uh, I think he might have been native Iowa City, and I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, lived up, I think, on Brown Street or that area uh, near downtown Iowa City. But he had just, he was a very popular individual across that bridge very well, like I say, between town and town. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, and, was a part, and was an originator of the Alumni Association or participated in the Alumni Association at the university. And so this uh, area of the Distinguished Alumni Awards of the University of Iowa was named after him. Mm -hmm. And in 2006, they were gracious enough to recognize me for my service on the alumni That's board. Great. I That's had served on the board and served, ultimately served as president in that capacity and w did work on some dysfunction and improving some dysfunction while Good. I was there. Yeah. Good. Careful. You, you, people will call you, be calling <laughs> you to help with boards that are having a few problems. I want to ask, how did you meet your wife, Becky? Well, I'd heard about Becky, of course, because she was the girl that was born the same day I was and had the same doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, but we actually didn't meet until uh, junior high. And it was, you know, right at the beginning of junior high where we spotted each other as that person. Junior high? Junior high at, at uh, Central in uh -huh. Iowa City. And junior high was two years back then. It, I mean, sorry, three years back then, seventh, eighth, and ninth. And uh, we were acquaintances, but not much more than that mm -hmm. during junior high. Yeah. Until high school. Until high school. And then at the end of our sophomore year, we clicked. We, we sort of clicked and started dating and kept dating and kept dating. And uh -huh. finally, I uh, got married right when we both graduated from college. And you went to Harvard out of high school. And yes. she went someplace she back? Went, well, actually, she went first to Iowa State for uh -huh. a year, and then one semester at University of Iowa, and then she transferred to Boston University. So we close. did spend, yeah, very close. <laughs> she crossed the river, but sure. very close in, in, in Boston. And uh, so we did spend a few years together in college, too. And you have two children. Tell, we do. Tell uh, us about where they are and what they're about. We have uh, our son is the oldest, Sam. Uh, he's now grown up. He just turned 32, which is hard to believe. Mm -hmm. And Sam uh, developed a passion in high school uh, in the culinary area. He wanted to be a chef, which we were just shocked with and concerned about because Becky and I both went to liberal arts uh, education mm -hmm. and Sam wanted to go to culinary school and so uh, but he wanted not to go to culinary school generally he wanted to go to a specific culinary school so he took us there or we traveled there when he was a senior in uh, high school and the place just blew us away it was so amazing and so he ended up going to the Culinary Institute of America and he did a four-year program there their uh, associate program and their baccalaureate program and then he had his first job was in Boston, where our daughter happened to be at the time, going to Boston University. And he was there for two and a half years at a very fine restaurant. Got wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And then he went to New York City and was there for about five years. And it ended up working with the Momofuku Restaurant Group, which is a very well-known group in New York City and other places. And most recently, they made him an executive chef of three new restaurants in Toronto that they opened just this last year. So wow. Sam is doing very well in Toronto as a chef. He's married, married two years ago, and he and his wife, Ryan, live in, in Toronto. In Toronto. And are expecting our first grandchild in November. Very exciting. And our daughter, Emma, is a few years younger. Emma is uh, 29, and uh, she uh, presently resides in Atlanta. She's been there since October. She works for the uh, Center for Disease Control. She. Um, she did go to liberal arts college. She went to Boston University, and then she came to the University of Iowa and got a master's in public health 
in mm -hmm. uh, behavioral uh, in, in community and behavioral uh, public health. And then she did a f uh, worked at the university for a year uh, on our research program, and then um, uh, did a fellowship with the CDC, where she was one year in Atlanta and two years in Madison working for the state government on assignment. And then she, after she completed that, she applied for a more permanent job with the CDC. Wow. So Wonderful. she's there, and her area of interest is in uh, immunolo uh, immunology. And um, she works in the National uh, Office for Children Immunization. Great. Uh, oh which goodness. is, I think she said their budget is four and a half billion dollars or something like that annually, so. My goodness, that's yeah. wonderful. Um, I always ask my guests, besides your parents, who has had a major influence on you? Interesting. Um, from a professional standpoint, uh, one of my partners was a great mentor, uh, Chuck Mullen. Mm -hmm. He's deceased, uh, prematurely deceased, uh, but Chuck was a great lawyer, a great guy, and uh, uh, really a wonderful mentor from a professional standpoint. Uh, when I was, um, uh, I think there were some teachers out at West High that were very influential. Mm -hmm. Uh, David Canellis is a, oh. was a wonderful guy, wonderful teacher. And what was that? What was that remark? It, yeah, the great remark that David made, which I, I'm, I don't think it originated with him. He says, "Take your work very seriously, but never take yourself too seriously." So that's been a hallmark for you. I, I try to do that. Sometimes mm -hmm. I, I think I take myself too seriously and, and catch myself. That's too. a great but comment from it, David. It was a great comment from David, and it's the way he lived his life and mm -hmm. did it so well. And it, it's a wonderful lesson, particularly in Iowa City, where a lot of people take themselves very seriously. Right. And so when you're, when you're out there in the community participating, you deal with those people, and you need to be thoughtful about not taking yourself too seriously. Right. Yeah. Okay, I know you don't have much time with your schedule and all your give back to the community, and I, I've seen you in your yard, so I think that must be a place for you to kind of kick back and recharge your batteries. Um, where do you see yourself in 10 years? What do you want to do? I, I know you've had some incredible adventures, mountain climbing. Yes, yeah. I, I think we'd like to continue to do adventures. Becky and I, when we, we've done a little bit of traveling, and I'm not a great beach person. I don't hold still real well, mm -hmm. as you can probably see. But um, <laughs> So when we've done vacations before, we, we, travel, we mm -hmm. travel and we've done some adventures. And we, we've uh, joined Chuck. Huss on a couple of his, or a couple of his adventures. Becky's actually been on three. I've been on two. Uh, one of those was uh, uh, Becky went to Peru and Machu Picchu. We did the the trail, you know, the Inca Trail, mm -hmm. and together we've been with Chuck on actually three other uh, adventures. One uh, to Africa where we climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and did uh, the Serengeti, which was an incredible, you know, once in a lifetime tri trip. And then we did a, a week-long excursion in the Alps, where we every day we climbed to a peak and or to a pass and climbed down. So we hiked for a week in the Alps, which was spectacular. Very different than Africa, but spectacular. How did you get prepare yourself physically for that? Uh, not well enough, but <laughs> but by the end of the week you're you're prepared. You're prepared, and uh, just a little walking, just walking. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then the most recent was a trip to Belize where we kayaked for a week and from key to key kayaked. It was really uh, quite nice. So that's what you're looking forward to down the road. I think we would like to do yeah, more traveling, more, more adventures. Mm -hmm. uh, some point, I haven't figured out what to do about work. I'm still heavily engaged in work. Sure. Uh, thinking about retirement, but not planning for retirement. Well, yet. you'll have that trip up there to visit that new grandchild. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, that'll be. You'll be in Toronto quite Toronto a bit. Toronto and and likely it, Atlanta as well. It, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my last question is: uh, if somebody from out of state or out of Iowa City asked you, what's the best thing about, or one of the best things about living in Iowa City? What would you say? Oh, I mean, I know yeah. you work for the Chamber of Commerce, so. Yeah, well, I, 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 for year, years ago now, but um, I think the best part about Iowa City is the quality of life. I mean, it really is a wonderful quality of life. There's so many things that we take for granted here that other places, you know, I mean, my commute to work is less than 10 minutes each direction. And if I have to stop at one stoplight behind two cars, I get angry, you know. <laughs> so, so I think and the quality of life, the opportunities for participation, 
bringing up your children here and, and, and the incredible schools that we have here, our, our high schools, both of them, City High and West High and Regina, all three of them, mm -hmm. are just second to none. I mean, they're fabulous places. And uh, I mean, when our kids go to these high schools, they can go anywhere, period. They can go anywhere, you know. And, and I think that's, that's part of it. I mean, it's just a wonderful place to be. It's, it's more cosmopolitan in feel than its population, mm -hmm. which I think prepared me to go away for my years away and then when I came back. And I think that's, that's really what it's about. Good well, place. on that positive note, I'll say thank you for being my guest. Thank you, it's been <laughs> a lot of fun, thank you. My guest on One of a Kind has been Tom Gelman, a West High graduate, Harvard, a U of I College of Law. Tom practices law in the law firm of Phelan Tucker, Mullen, Walker, Tucker, and Gelman. He has spent his adult life not only working in his profession, but giving back to his community and the university in a multitude of ways. He's the recipient of the Friend of the Year Award given by the Iowa City Public Library and the Distinguished Lauren Hickerson Award. Words used to describe my guest are analytical, dedicated, pragmatic, witty, kind, and a family man. Tom Gelman is one of a kind. <laughs>